Hey guys, welcome back. It's lesson 33. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into the whole angular momentum, orbital angular momentum. Next time we'll we'll start with spin, but uh, let's see where we are. I want you to remember that um, last time we discussed the x, y, and z components of orbital angular momentum. And in particular, we discovered that um, you can know at any one moment a single component of angular momentum but not the other two. And mathematically, the way that comes out is that the x and y components of angular momentum have a non-zero commutator. That means that it matters. If you measure one first and then the other, you get a different result than if you measure them in the opposite order. That's the same way um, position and momentum are incompatible observables. That means that you can't simultaneously have an eigenstate of both observables. That means you can have an eigenstate of LZ, but then it won't be an eigenstate of LX and LY, and, and similarly for the others. So uh, the convention is that we pick LZ as our preferred axis and, and use eigenstates of Z component of angular momentum to describe what's going on. Of course, that's completely arbitrary. You could pick X or Y. In fact, you can define your Z axis to point any way in space you wish. And uh, what it boils down to is we always pick the z-axis to point along the direction in space in which we're interested in describing the, uh, the wave functions or, or uh, quantum states as superpositions of well-defined components of angular momentum in that direction. That's, that's the idea. Um, the other thing that we discovered was that the magnitude of the angular momentum does commute with all three components. So what it boils down to is that you can know the total angular momentum, L squared, um, which is the square of the magnitude of the angular momentum, and any one component, and the component we normally pick is the Z component. Okay. It also uh, turns out that the eigenvalue of L squared is H bar squared times L times L plus 1, where L is an integer that describes the uh, total angular momentum in as a uh, in units basically of h bar. So uh, that's how that works. And the z component of angular momentum has an eigenvalue that's h bar times m, where m is again an integer <coughs> for orbital angular momentum. We'll find out when we start involving spin that uh, m will be permitted to be half integer because you have a spin of a half, for example, for the electron and the proton. And uh, so the z component has a uh, eigenvalue of h bar times this number m. So any given uh, quantum state can be expressed as a superposition of states of well-defined L and well-defined m, little l and little m, which correspond to the magnitude of the angular momentum squared and the z component of angular momentum. Now as a helper, as an assistance, we invented these L plus minus operators, which are constructed by adding or subtracting the X and Y versions with an I multiplied by the Y. And basically, there was no reason given for this other than that they're useful. Uh, it, Griffiths demonstrated, and I think I showed it in the last set of slides as well, that uh, if you apply L plus or L minus to a state uh, little l, little m, you get a state with the same value of little l, but uh, a value of little m that's one more or one less than the state you had before. Now what I didn't show, but what you can show fairly easily, there's a homework problem in the chapter about this, <coughs> is that uh, similar to the raising and lowering operators from the simple harmonic oscillator, if you hit L plus or minus on a state with a little l, little m, uh, not only do you get a state with little m increased or decreased by one, but there's a factor out in front that depends on the values of little l and little m and an h bar. And you can deduce this using the, uh, I, the definition of l squared that's based on l plus minus times l minus plus, I think, uh, and then it's plus lz squared plus h bar lz or plus minus h bar lz. I, I forget the exact equation, but uh, you can find it in Griffiths or you can find it in the last set of slides. What I want to do right now is to spend a little time focusing on a particular system, which uh, 
turns out to be enlightening, at least I think it can be enlightening, and that, that's the system when little l is equal to 1. In other words, when you have a orbital angular momentum of 1, then you know m can go from minus 1 to plus 1 in steps of 1. So that means it only has three possible values. So for l equals 1, we have three possible values of m. m can be plus 1, that would be the 1, 1 ket. M could be minus 1. That sort of corresponds to no z component of angular momentum. Uh, that would be the 1, 0 ket. And M can be minus 1, which would be the 1, minus 1 ket. And uh, <coughs> these three states all have the same magnitude of angular momentum, but they have different z components of angular momentum. And it's useful to sort of think about how th what that means and how it works and so on. So what I want to do right now is to remind you what the those three states look like in the hydrogen atom by looking at the 2, 1, 1, 2, 1, 0, and 2, 1, minus 1 states using that uh, visualization trick that I cooked up for the last set of slides. Okay, so uh, here is the picture of the 2, 1, 1 hydrogen energy eigenstate looking straight down the z-axis and if we turn on the time you'll notice the thing goes counterclockwise um, if I uh, I'll let that loop a second and you can see that it just goes and goes um, so this is the L equals 1 M equals plus 1 state looking straight down the z-axis now let me switch to the minus 1 state here's the um, same thing when the minus one state and it just goes the other way and you can see that uh, if you look at it from one of the other directions if you look at it for example from the negative x-axis it just looks like kind of a blur of color but if you look at it along and there it is along the negative y-axis so here it is about the z-axis here it is about the negative y-axis and this is what it looks like about the negative x-axis okay so this is the minus one state. And you, it's about the same idea for the plus one state. So now let's look at the two, one, zero state. That's the one where uh, there's no z component of angular momentum. Looking straight down the z-axis, you see it looks just like a blob. But if you tip it up, if you tip it up and look at it, you'll notice that uh, it's got structure in the theta direction. Um, but it has no phase change as you go around the z-axis. If you go around the z-axis, the phase is constant. Looking at it straight down the z-axis, it's a constant color in this picture. And that's another way of saying that, uh, there you go, the thing is uh, got no z component of angular momentum. But it does have some angular momentum because it's got structure in the, in the theta direction. Okay. Okay, now that we've refreshed our memory about what those three states look like in the hydrogen atom, uh, I want to discuss how you construct operators, how you construct matrices that represent operators. And I want to go back to the pizza, feed the pizza operators from the skinny mouse, fat mouse tutorial. You guys remember that one, I hope. You still have the tutorial, I hope, if you want to read about the feed the pizza operator. But basically, if you feed pizza to a skinny mouse, you get a fat mouse. And if you feed pizza to a fat mouse, you get no mouse at all. In other words, uh, the mouse dies or the mouse ceases to exist in some meaningful way. Now, if we represent the skinny mouse as a vector, 1, 0, and we represent the fat mouse as the vector, 0, 1, you can see that those two vectors are mutually orthogonal to each other. And also, given that representation, given that basis, that set of basis vectors, we can represent the feed the pizza operator quite easily. If you feed the pizza to a skinny mouse, you get a fat mouse. So the first column of the feed the pizza operator has to be 0, 1. And if you feed pizza to a fat mouse, you get a dead mouse, or no mouse at all, which means that column has to be all zeros. Now the next question is, what is the adjoint of the feed the pizza operator. Now this was uh, part of the tutorial and just 
for completeness, I want to go ahead and explain to you how you get that. The definition of adjoint is that uh, if you hit the skinny mouse on what you get when you feed the pizza to the fat mouse, that's the same thing as hitting the skinny mouse with the adjoint to feed the pizza and then taking the fat mouse inner product with the result. Now, since feeding pizza to a fat mouse gives you no mouse at all, we know the skinny mouse and the fat mouse components of feed the pizza to the fat mouse are zero. And that tells us what the fat mouse components of P dagger or feed the pizza dagger, feed the pizza adjoint operator are when feed the pizza dagger is applied to the skinny mouse and the fat mouse. They've got to both be zero. So it doesn't make any difference if you feed the if you take the feed the pizza adjoint operator on the skinny mouse or the fat mouse, you don't get any fat mouse when you're done. Uh, so those are zero. Similarly, if you feed pizza to a skinny mouse, you do get a fat mouse, so that's a one. Feeding the pizza to a skinny mouse has no skinny mouse component because all you get is a fat mouse. There's no skinny mouse. <coughs> And then uh, looking at the definition of what P dagger means, you see that feeding the pizza adjoint to a fat mouse gives you a skinny mouse. Feeding the pizza adjoint to a skinny mouse does not give you any skinny mouse component. That tells us right away what P dagger is. So I'm not, I didn't tell you what P dagger was. I'd simply worked out what it had to be based on the definitions of P, what P did to the basis vectors. And you can see P dagger looks like it's the transpose of P. Notice what it does if you hit P dagger on a skinny mouse you get no mouse at all. If you hit P dagger on a fat mouse you get a skinny mouse. So P dagger is kind of like a starvation operator. If you starve a skinny mouse you get a dead mouse. If you starve a fat mouse you get a skinny mouse. So P and P dagger are not observables. They're not Hermitian. They are not unitary. Um, but they are adjoints of one another. So that's just a little uh, more experience with operators and how you deal with them. But let's go back to uh, L plus and L minus. Now what do we know about L plus and L minus? Let's, let's pick a basis for our three state system, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, minus 1. We'll make 1, 1. <coughs> we'll make 1, 1, the 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 1 minus 1, 0, 0, 1. So those are our three basis vectors for the L equals 1 subspace of sort of angular momentum space, I guess, if you want to think about that. And we know what L plus and L minus do. If you apply L plus to the 1 minus 1 state, you get the 1, 0 state. Multiplied by this uh, factor out in front, which I went ahead and computed here, it turns out to be h bar times the square root of 2 in this case. And L plus acting on 1, 0, again gives you h bar times the square root of 2, but this time it's times 1, 1. Notice the m went up by 1. The L stayed the same. And finally, if you apply L plus to 1, 1, if you calculate the coefficient out in front, it's a 0, so you get nothing. But with the same sort of plan that we used to find the matrix representation of the pizza operator, we can now just write down the matrix representation of L plus. It's got to be this. If you apply L plus to 1, 1, you get nothing. If you apply it to 1, 0, you get the square root of 2 h bar times 1, 1. And if you apply it to 1 minus 1, you get the square root of 2 h bar times 1, 0. And that's exactly what that matrix says. Uh, Similarly, you can get L minus, or you can just notice that L minus is the adjoint of L plus, and you can get the, just take the transpose of the darn thing, and that turns out to be L minus. But what good are L plus and L minus? Well, L plus and L minus are good for the following reason. We know that L plus and L minus are defined in terms of Lx and Ly. So I can write Lx as the sum of L plus and L minus divided by 2. And that's also got to be true of the matrix representation of Lx. So what this allows us to do is to write down a matrix representation for the x component of L and the y component of L. Now notice our basis is the z component of L basis. In other words, 1, 0, 0 is Lz is plus 1, 1, 0, 1 is Lz is minus 1, and 0, 0, 1 is Lz is 
um, minus 1. And what this tells us is that if you apply Lx to the Lz is plus 1 state, what you get is the Lz is 0 state times uh, h bar over the square root of 2. So that gives you a sense of what the thing does. If you apply Lx to the Lz is 0 state, you get a superposition of Lz is plus 1 and Lz is minus 1, and so on. So that tells you what the Lx operator actually does to the basis kets in the Lz basis. Um, and similarly, you can work out the Ly matrix. Um, what I want to do now is to think about what happens if I compute the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of Lx. Let's just focus on Lx. It turns out, um, well, in fact, for both Lx and Ly, the eigenvalues turn out to be h-bar, 0, and minus h-bar. In other words, no matter which axis you choose, Lx, Ly, or Lz, you get the same eigenvalues. If you measure the angular momentum of a state where the total angular momentum is, has one unit, when little l is 1, the only thing you're going to get for any component of the angular momentum is h-bar, 0, and minus h-bar, no matter what axis you pick. But the eigenvectors are, in fact, different. The eigenvectors for Lx turn out to be uh, these guys. And you can see, and you can do this by simply applying the formula, applying the strategy for finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues to those matrices. Um, Lx is plus h-bar, has an eigenvector 1 half, 1 over the square root of 2, 1 half and Lx is minus h-bar is 1 half minus 1 to the square root of 2, 1 half, and Lx equals 0 is plus 1 over the square root of 2 and minus 1 over the square root of 2. These are all these are normalized eigenvectors. What I want to emphasize is that uh, each of these eigenvectors represents states with a well-defined value of the Lx component, but you can see that they're all superpositions of different components of Lz. So that means that if you have a well-defined value of Lx, let's say you're in the Lx is plus h-bar state, then you've got a 25% chance, if you measured Lz when the thing was in that state, you'd have a 25% chance of getting plus 1, a 25% chance of getting minus 1, and a 50% chance of getting 0. So it's not a state of well-defined Lz. And neither are the other two states of well-defined Lx. And the situation is Analogous, similar, if you, uh, if you do the same thing with Ly. There are three eigenvectors for Ly, and uh, they are superpositions of states of well-defined Lz. So it's kind of fascinating. I, I need you to think about that a little bit, ask questions, but uh, it's a fairly subtle thing, but it, it's important that you understand the basic idea. So... That's all there is. I basically just wrote that out. States of well-defined angular momentum about the x and y axis can be expressed as superpositions of states with well-defined angular momentum about the z axis. Now what I want to do now is to go back to the visualization stuff and actually see what one of these states, which is a superposition of states of well-defined Lz, looks like in the context of the hydrogen atom. So let's do that and then we'll be done. Finally, this is what we get if you uh, let's go. Let's look at the code. This is the setup for uh, the superposition of a little bit of m equals plus one, a little bit of m equals zero, a little bit of m equals minus one. It's a half unit of minus one, one over the square root of two units of zero, and a half unit of plus one. If you go back to the video, you'll notice. Uh, looking straight down the z-axis, it looks like a blob of color. So this is some kind of crazy combination of plus 1, minus 1, and 0. But watch what happens when we rotate the thing to show the x-axis. Along the x-axis, it's got, it looks just like the m equals plus 1 state did along the z-axis. Let me run that in real time run it as a video and you can see what that looks like. There it is. There it is around the x-axis and it looks just like it the m equals plus one state did around the z-axis but now it's going around the x-axis. This is a state of well-defined L sub x. 
it's L sub x equals plus 1. You could do the same thing for L sub x equals minus 1 or L sub x equals 0. Uh, and it would look just like it does in the case of the, uh, of the L sub z equals plus 1, minus 1, and 0, except it would be about the x-axis instead of about the z-axis. So think about that. That's pretty crazy. Talk to you soon.